it's good to be here tonight as we gather for our Bible study. We've come to a decision that for, for a while yet, yeah, we're still going to just do the live streaming. We're not going to be meeting on Wednesday evenings. And we couldn't anyway this next two weeks because of BBS. But we got some other things going on, and so we just want to uh, keep that in prayer. Uh, we thank God tonight for the opportunity that we still are able to have the Bible study. We're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 13, verses um, 26 to 52. And over these scriptures and I, we're just going to look at God's word and just see what he is speaking to our lives about. How he wants to guide us and he wants to lead us and direct us in, in truth. And we want to stand on the things that God has in store for each and every one of us. Um, when we look at his word, we want to be mindful uh, that it is in Christ that we live and we move and we have our being. And God has a plan for our lives. And so as we go to the word tonight, let us be mindful to just say, God, we, we want you to be God in our life. We want you to guide us. We want you to hold us, keep us, and reveal yourself to us. And, and that's what Paul has been talking about to the children of God uh, during this time period. And so I'm asking that the Lord would just open up our understanding to the scripture tonight. As we look at verses 26 through uh, 29 and uh, to begin with. But let us have a word of prayer. Father, we just thank you tonight, Lord, as we come and gather in the name of Jesus. We ask, Lord, that you would lead us, guide us, and direct us. Open our understanding, Lord, that you have had a plan from the beginning when you formed Adam and Eve, Lord, in the garden, Lord. You've had a plan for a family, Lord. You had a, a plan, Lord, that, that mankind would have the right relationship with you. And your desire, Lord, is a family that we would be children of God and trust you, Lord, and to lead us, guide us, Lord, that our faith would be in you and that our experiences in life would come, Lord, because of who you are. Help us, Lord, as we would embrace, Lord, your word tonight and ask that you would guide us and help us. Remember, Lord, that and re reminding ourselves, Lord, that we just need you. And apart from you, Lord, we can do nothing. And so, Lord, I pray tonight as we look at the word that you would open our understanding. Holy Spirit, we just want you to have your way. And now, Lord, I ask that you give us ears to hear and a heart to receive and the courage, Lord, to walk out your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And so Acts 13, verses 26 through 29, it reads, Fellow children of Abraham and you God-fearing Gentiles, it is to us that this message of salvation has been sent. The people of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize Jesus, yet in condemning him, they fulfilled the word of the prophets that they read every Sabbath. Though they found no prop proper grounds for the death sentence, they had Pilate to execute Jesus. And when they had carried out all that was written about him, they took him down from the cross and laid him in the tomb. When we're looking at the scripture, Paul has been sharing with them about what they had done to Jesus. We looked at the scripture last time that we met, and you remember that we talked about uh, in Genesis how that God has spoken to Abraham and called Abram and said that, I want you to follow me. And out of him, he said, I would create a nation out of you. We know that Abraham for 25 years followed God before Isaac was born. And in that birth, it said that God made the same promise to Isaac and also then to Jacob. And the promises was, was that he would put them in captivity. They would be there for 400 years. He would bring them out of, an, out of that captivity and place them in uh, back in the Canaan land that he had shown Abram to have. He told Abraham to just walk with me, trust me and by faith and, and see what I, what I will not do to those who uh, that come against me and that how I would bless you in that time. He said, and I will be with you. Abraham, by faith, trusted God. And 25 years after God had spoken to him, he brought forth a son. And when we looked at the scriptures uh, in the last time that we were together, it just reminded us of what Paul had been sharing with them. And that we looked at that in Genesis and we continued on in it. We were mindful of the fact that God had promised out of the seed of David that he would provide a savior. And it went like this, that it talked about men of Israel who fear God. That Paul was addressing both what those that were in the synagogue uh, on the Sabbath, both the Jews and then near Jews. Those were Gentiles who had not accepted uh, 
Judaism, but they had believed in with the God that they had been talking about. And Paul went on to share with them because just like Cornelius, they were looking for something more. They heard, but they also had heard the message that Jesus had been preaching. They had heard and, and what things had happened when the Christians had started coming forth. So they believed that, that the Jewish God was God. They did not understand everything, but there was something in their heart that caused them to, to pray, to trust, and to even give to the Jewish community that that they have and bring their, their offering unto the Lord. And so Paul is sharing with them that, that, they, that God had made a promise, and it went like this. According to the promise, God raised up for Israel a Savior, Jesus. And this was the survey of Israel's history, and Paul began to share that with them. That he first talked about that he the chosen of the patriarchs and that God the God of the people of Israel chose our ancestors and that's what he said and what was that Isaac Jacob Isaac uh, Abraham Isaac and Jacob and out of that it says that the tribes came forth and we saw that out of out of those that birth of those children that 400 years later after being in captivity they said there was a nation that walked out of out of Egypt somewhere in the numbers of a million to possibly two million people. But he goes on down the line and began to talk about the patriarchs, and he talked about their deliverance from Egypt, that he made the people prosper during their stay in Egypt. With a mighty power, he led them out of that country. And now this is what's happened after 400 years after God had talked to Abram about it, and everything he shared that had not happened, it did happen, according to God's word. It goes on to tell us about the time in the wilderness, and that they crossed over, and because of their disobedience, for 40 more years that they were there in the promised land, but could not have the promised land because of their disobedience to the things of God. And then over the next 10 years, they, they grew, and they, and they were able to take the land. So it talked about the conquest in Canaan. And it says that he overthrew seven nations in Canaan, just as he had promised. For when God spoke to Abram, he said, look out, all this land I would give to you. And he said, and you will conquer them. But he said, their sins not yet have come to me for me to bring judgment on it. But 450 years later, he brought judgment upon those people and he took the land. And what that shows is about a merciful and a gracious God. What he's saying, I know that your hearts are far from me, but he continues to what? To reveal himself. There will no one ever will stay in that day of judgment and be able to stand in that day of judgment and be able to say, God, you did not give me a chance because God gave He's given all of us a chance to see his glory. In fact, the scriptures tell us in Romans that what? That we can look at creation and we can know there is a God. There is no such thing as a big bang theory that it just happened. No, there was a creator and the creator created all things that exist to this day. So it says to them that he brought them out of the time of the wilderness and it was the 40 years that they were there in the wilderness and he made the people prosper during their stay in Egypt. With a mighty power, he led them out of the country. They conquered the land there in Canaan, and he gave their land to his people for an inheritance, as he had promised. And then he gave them judges. And after God gave them judges until the time of Samuel, the prophet. And then it says in creation, he gave them a monarch. It, it, because why the people asked for a king. Here they had God leading their lives, and they said, Lord, we want to be like everyone else. We want a king. They rejected God's love. There's times that we want to be more like the world, that we miss out what God is wanting to reveal to us in his glory that we can have as believers in Christ Jesus. We need to be careful. We're going to be challenged from time to time because we're looking at how the world does things and we try to run the body of Christ like a business. We're not a business. We're a ministry of Jesus Christ. We're not led by our thoughts and ideal or the plans of man. We are led by the power of God that is in us through Jesus Christ. And shame on us any time that we think that we have to operate like the world operates because why? We are created in the image of the living God. And that is where our hope and our strength is in. And so it says that during that time that they had asked for a king, and he says, and they gave them Saul, the son of Kish, and he was from the tribe of Benjamin, and he ruled for 40 years. But after God removed Saul because of his disobedience, it said David there became their king. And God testified David concerning him. He says, I found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart who will do everything I want him to do. 
And yet what we find when we read the story of David and all those things there, that he trusted God, he believed God. You read the Psalms, and, and when he came short of the glory of God, he repented, and he said, Lord, you know, create in me a clean heart. But what we find is that what David, as a believer in God, he was not perfect. He was not perfect, and yet God is faithful to his promises, and that's what we want to see in the Word, that everything he promised to them, he fulfilled. And in those scriptures that we looked in Genesis, that the fulfillment of what God has promised, and what he promised later on to them, that out of the seed of David, there would be one that was set upon that throne, and says, from this man, the descendants, God had brought to Israel the Savior Jesus as he promised. Now, Paul is sharing these things with them, that God did, did it, all which led up to Jesus. So everything that had been done, from the promise from Abraham to that moment that Jesus Christ was born was exactly for the plan that God had laid out to restore man from the fall of the first, first Adam that he created a second Adam, and his name is Jesus, one that is able to save. And so he'd been sharing, and he poured out, and he was laying out the word of God. And it's important that we understand that we can stand on God's promises. And so tonight when we're looking, Paul continues on in the, the message that he had shared with them. He said, fellow children of Abraham and you God-fearing Gentiles, it is to us that this message of salvation has been sent. The people of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize Jesus. And that's what he was saying. Though they were brought up and they had, God had given them a promise, they embraced the law instead of embracing the promise. They embraced something that they could do in themselves and failed miserably doing it because what they tried to do was fulfill their fullness of life in the relationship with God by being good according to the word of God. And the only thing that the law had promised them was that they could never live it out to be good enough to receive the God's promises. And so when we look at scripture, it was not about the promise of circumcision that we have talked about in scripture and, and when we were going through Colossians, it's talking about what their heart had to be cut. The, the life uh, that they lived in in the natural had to be cut and their heart and their faith had to what? Turn to God. What God is talking to you and talking to me about it and all of us is that we need to grow in our relationship and understand it's not about the things we do, it's about who we do them for. It's about our relationship with God that comes through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so when Paul was sharing these things with them, he was letting them know that the Jewish community turned their hearts from God. And they would not believe the promise, even though their ancestors and it was foretold in the word that they read, they did not embrace it. How many times do we look at the word of God and we pick out the things we like? We like the things when God says he'll bless us in this thing and bless us in that way. And we pray and wait on the blessings of God and shout hallelujah. But then when he says that, I want you to allow your life to be surrendered under to me. And then God begins to challenge us in ways that are uncomfortable to us. We begin to say, well, Lord, you know, that's not necessarily who I am. You know, I'll do this for you, but I won't do that. Now, it can be just as simple as doing what? To pray to stand up before others. I was talking to a young man today and was talking about how do you, how do you get up and you talk and, and share those things that you know that God has done into your life. And the word of God that we have been studying has shared with us that what? That the Holy Spirit would give us what we need when we need it. And that's what God has promised, that if we would just be faithful and say, Lord, I'm going to be a light, that he's going to touch us in a way that our light will be brighter than that of a, a night light, which is still light that scatters the darkness, but he will allow us to be what? He will allow us to be that light that is a, that will beam out, that will show them like that of a, a, a what is that? a lighthouse. That would be that that would be able to shine in the darkness that others can come and begin to come to a place of safety. And there's no other place of safety than you get than that that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. And so Paul is sharing out and he's pouring out his heart and he's telling the people, those that were uh, Jewish believers that had come to know Christ and accepted him as his savior, and then also to the Gentiles who were God-fearing. And then there was those that were there that day that he was speaking, because why? They told him and asked him if he would share a word with them during that time. 
And so he was there on the Sabbath day. There was believing Jews and there was non-believing Jews. And then there was Gentiles who had received Christ as their, their Savior. And he's sharing this word and he's pouring it out to them. And he shares it and he tells them, The people of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize Jesus. And yet in condemning him, they fulfilled the word of God, uh, the word of the prophets that read every Sabbath. What was said was that they did as they, they talked as if they did not have understanding. And yet it was the same word they had read, Sabbath after Sabbath after Sabbath. For many, many hundreds of years, they read these words, and yet they didn't embrace it and didn't see it. How many times have you and I have quoted a scripture and we say it? I can do all things through Christ who is my strength. And then we find ourselves not doing anything. We don't believe that we're capable of doing it because why? I'm not this person. I, I'm not been able to study. I don't know this word that well. I don't know this here. But the truth of it is, do you have a heart for Jesus? And when he says you understand that we can do all things, then one of the things that we can do is begin to put clothe ourselves in the glory of him, clothe ourselves in his word, and clothe ourselves in, and begin to say, Lord, I want to live a life that is that brings you glory and brings you honor. And when we begin to do that, we find ourselves stepping out of who we are and becoming the person that God has called us to be. Paul's encouraging them and letting them know that when they when they lied on Jesus and that he was crucified, the word of God that they had read was said that he would hang on a tree. And so we're going to be looking at those things and, and tonight in this word because why? God is revealing himself to us about the might and the glory of who Christ is for our lives. So he goes on to say that in what they did in condemning Jesus, they fulfilled the word of the prophets that are read every Sabbath. Though they found no proper ground to for death sentence, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written about him, they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. According to scriptures, that's exactly what that had been spoken by the prophets, that he would be laid in the tomb. And so when we look at the scripture, we can hold on to the truth of God's word. The people both received and rejected Jesus. It says, As for those who dwelt in Jerusalem, there were rulers because they did not know him. And those who didn't know the scriptures rejected Jesus and delivered him into Pilate to be executed. This was true, even though they lived in Jerusalem and were rulers among the Jews, therefore Jesus was executed and laid in a tomb. Sometimes we can get so caught up in doing the, the religious things that we miss out for what we're called to really do. We can get so busy in the stuff, making sure we dot this I and cross that T that we miss out on the relationship that God wants to have and he wants to reveal himself and we don't see him because why? We're so busy doing the stuff. So it says they took him down from the tree and they called the cross a tree and Paul drew on the ideal in Deuteronomy 21, 20, chapter 21, verses 22 and 23 and that passage says that God cursed a person who is hung from the tree. Paul wanted to communicate the idea that Jesus was cursed so that we could be blessed. Isn't that goodness of God? He took our sin upon him that what? That we could be free from sin by faith in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation for those who what? Put their faith and their hope and their trust in the Lord. And verses 30 to 37, it said, But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he was seen by those who traveled with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. And they are now his witnesses to our people. We tell you the good news, what God promised our ancestors. He has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus as it is written in the second Psalms. In Psalms 2, verse 7, it says, you are my son, today I have become your father. And that's what he was talking about, that, that Jesus is the son of God. And God was saying, and this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And he had testified about that in Psalms, and it was fulfilled hundreds of years later. 
the fullness of God, the promises of God, and what he has in store for our lives, that he wants us to begin to embrace this word and understand that we can apply the scriptures to our life and begin to understand that we can live a life victoriously in Christ Jesus. And what I'm talking about is that the things that set us up and trip us up, the things that, that are in us by nature, us don't like cuss this that and the other we like the things of the world all of these things that our flesh loves when we come to Christ he said set it apart because why well, I want to show you something greater but it's hard to set it apart if we don't believe that God is greater than the circumstances we find ourselves facing day in and day out but it says that if we trust in his word there will be a transformation in our life and that is good news to us so we tell you the good news, what God had promised. And so he says about Jesus, and they read it in the, in the Psalms, the things that they had read uh, on, on the Sabbath day, that Paul has just reminded them that here it said, you are my son today and have become, and I've become your father. That God raised him from the dead so that he will never be subject to decay. And as God has said, I will give you the holy, I, I will I will give you the holy and sure blessing promised to David. And that's what he said about the Savior that would come. So it is also stated elsewhere, you will not let your body, your holy one, see decay. The promise of God that he raised him up, Jesus did not see decay. They understood when you plant that body in the ground, it will decay. It will turn to dust. For the what? That it will return to the earth where it came from. For Adam was what? Formed out of the dirt and he returned back to the dirt. But it said the promise of God would never see decay. Though Jesus died on the cross, he did not swoon. He did not get knocked out. Those things, he died. They pierced him in his side when they took him down. If there's anything that the Roman people knew how to do, they knew how to crucify. They knew how to kill a person. Jesus died on the cross. But no man took his life. He laid his life down that you and I might be saved. See, there's a rejoicing in knowing how much God loves us that he sent his son to die in our place because we're born in sin. And what does sin do? Sin brings forth death. And so here it tells us here that the promise of God that was given, that it said that he would not see his holy one see decay. And then it goes on and says, and now when David has served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. He was buried with his ancestors, and his body decayed. But the one whom God raised from the dead did not see decay. So what we're looking at the scriptures is reminding us, David was speaking these things, he was prophesying what would happen to the one that was set on his throne. He would die the death that man can have what? A right relationship with God again. Because what? Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. Jesus died. His blood was shed. The Lamb of God was brought before, died for you and I that we might have life and have it eternal. So when we're looking at God's word, God speaks all of these things in the Bible. And the people ask many times, how do you know that the Bible is true? First thing that you know that the Bible is true because the things that it speaks of, only God could know. Only God is capable of doing. The one thing that everyone has tried to prove that there is no God and that Christianity isn't right is to disprove the word of God. The more that they try, the more that they find out that the word of God is truly standing on what is spoken. It's the word of God. It's not written by men. Do not get confused because God used people to write it. The word of God says it this way that the Holy Spirit comes upon them and they wrote as the Holy Spirit led them. See, it's consistent from Genesis to Revelation. There's never been a time that man can do anything on his own, speak on his own, and find consistency over that long period of generation after generation. The Word of God is what? It is the Word of God. And you and I can trust it. It doesn't matter if other people come against it. You need to know as a believer in Christ that this Word is your lifeline to the things that God wants you to know and understand through Him. These are wonderful words. The man did his best to fight against God and even to kill Jesus. But God was greater than man's sin 
and rebellion. And Jesus rose from the grave, winning over sin and death. I thank God that he had a plan for you and I. Because if you and I had to work this thing on our goodness, we would be heading straight to hell. Because never, none of us will ever be good enough that God would say, come on in. Your good works is enough to get you in. The Bible is clear that dwells in us, there is no good thing in you and in I. That's a hard thing to take because why we like to think that there's something good about us, but when we look at the nature of us apart from Jesus Christ, all of us are ugly. All of us are sinful in our actions and the things that we are doing. So when we're looking at the scripture, we need to be clear that God had a plan, and that plan is for you and I, for all mankind to come into the saving knowledge of the Lord. We looked at the scriptures earlier and we talked about the promises of God. And it lets us know that there are no, there's no reason for anyone to be able to, to say that God does not exist. For the scripture said what? And we said out of Romans that man can look at creation and know there is a God. Oh, when you hold that little baby in your arms, you know that there is a God to be blessed, to have this uh, blessing before you. And so when we're looking at this, I want us to embrace tonight that when, they, when Paul is sharing these words with them, he's trying to let them know that he's not speaking on himself. He's speaking to people that have had understanding of Scripture but had not embraced the truth of what God has spoken to them. And he's trying to open up their eyes, open up their understanding that they realize that God has been faithful to them as he is to you and I, who did not know him, he still has made a way that we could come to know him as the Lord and Savior of our life. But God raised him from the dead. Here the facts are simple and stated, yet evidence from eyewitnesses was also offered. And it says, and he was seen by many uh, days by those who kept, that came up with him. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I'm just going to read through it. We're not going to go through it. I'm just going to hear, let you hear the word of God and hear what it has to say. Now, brothers and sisters, and here again is the writing uh, that the Holy Spirit gave to Paul. He says, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received on which you have taken your stand. And by this gospel, you are saved. And if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. He's telling them that you, when you hear the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, he says you hold on to it. You stand on it. You know that is true because why? It has touched your life and changed your life. You see this transformation going on in you that you would have never desired, never knew, and even had an idea how to walk it. And now you're desiring it and you're wanting it and he says stand on it or what you have believed in vain he's telling you do not get sidetracked stay focused on that and he said this word that I given you that hold on to it and believe it that God has promised so when we talk about John 3 16 God will love God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. He said, hold on to that because why? You have believed on the only son of God, the promise that he has made. He goes on to share with them, for what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to Scripture, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to Scripture, and that he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Paul is just uh, giving us the the fullness of what we had read in Acts. He's sharing it now and letting them know that all of these things happen and that I'm talking this and you can meet over 500 people that will tell you the same thing. Now again, you can't put 500 people and get them to say the same story over. Have you ever been in a place that you saw an accident? And four, five, six, seven, ten of you saw the accident. And when the police come over to get a report, they get ten different reports. Because everybody saw something a little different. 
But these here were able to say, I've seen the risen Savior. I saw Jesus Christ, and he has risen. The Word of God reminds us that he was that he rose from the grave, and for 40 days he was visible to many. Then he appeared to James, it goes on to say, and then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me. And Paul is talking about himself as one... Uh, abnormally born and what he was saying I was not one of the twelve I was one who persecuted the church and God revealed himself on that road to Damascus to me and then he called me into the ministry and in this ministry he has called me to be an, an apostle for he says I am the least of the apostles and and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I have persecuted the, the, the church of God but by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. And so that grace that comes into our life, Paul is saying it's a transforming grace, that the sinner becomes alive in Christ. Our sins are forgiven, and our eyes are open to a Savior that is able to transform our life into the original plan that God had for man. We're separated in our sin, but we can now can come into the life and, and the promise that God has for all who put their faith and trust through Jesus Christ. Paul says that I was the least of them, and I persecuted the church. I, I did all these things. I'm glad to hear those things because why? Sometimes we sometimes think that we're not good enough for salvation and the promises of God. Well, the truth is none of us are good enough. But Jesus has done the finished work and all Paul is saying is that I'm able to do this because of what Christ has done for me. My faith in him has caused me to be set free because why? I was a scoundrel. I was one who was caught up in my religion and I missed out on the promise of God but one day he continued to speak to me, revealed himself to me and I accepted him as my Lord and Savior. Paul's going and he's sharing these things with them and he's letting them know about the grace that God gives all of us who put our trust in him. Verse 10, but, but by grace of God I am what I am and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I work harder than all of them, and yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. He's letting us know that there's a drive that comes into your heart when you receive Christ as your Savior. This drive is what? To read the Word, to study the Word, to show yourself a worker who's not as uh, ashamed, able to stand on that truth and begin to apply those principles of God. And, Colossians, we've been reading about what? That you rid yourself of the old man and you begin to dress yourself in the, in the new man that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That our life and how we approach life becomes different and that we find ourselves desiring the things of the Lord. And with this process that God is doing in us, it's a continuous growth that we have in Christ Jesus. The Bible talks about in First John and, and, uh, and that it talks about babies and children and, and then a young men and, and then and fathers. It talks about there's a progression in our growth and our relationship with God. You don't get saved and all of a sudden you just know everything. We're babies in this thing, but we continue to grow in the relationship and the word of God and it reveals to us who we are and can be in Christ Jesus. And he says that God's grace is so good that even I who persecuted the church, his love reaches out to me. So if you're in this place tonight and you're thinking, God will not reach out to me because why? I've been the least of these. I've been the worst of the worst. I, I've done this. I, I've done those things there. But there's no sin that you can do except for what? Blaspheme the Holy Spirit. That's just telling God that what Jesus did is not real and that there's no life apart from in, in him and that you are who you are and that others are fools to believe that story. But for you who receive Christ as your personal Savior, it doesn't matter where you come from. God's, the blood of Jesus is able to cleanse you because you have put your trust in the finished work of Calvary, that he died for your sins, he was buried, and he rose again on the third day. Paul is sharing all these things, that I am what I am, and his grace to me was without 
was not without effect. There ought to be a change in our life when Christ comes into our life. There ought to be a desire that we want more. So when he's talking about working harder, he's not talking about the fact that I do more than anyone. What he is saying is that I love the Lord and my desire is what? That none should perish, that all should come into everlasting life. There's something in us as believers in Christ. Do you not want your sons and daughters to know Jesus Christ? Do you not want your neighbor to be saved? Somehow you need to get out of yourself and begin to put on Jesus and begin to let people know the reason I go to church is because of Jesus Christ. My hope is not gathering with the people. My hope is in Christ Jesus. And I go because he touched my life. He forgave me of my sins. He gave me new life in him. And I'm telling you today, I'm a new person because of Christ. You need to be willing to, to share this hope with other people because why? This is what our salvation is all about. Our salvation is not that this is not our home. We're left here for one reason that others may see his good works in us. And Paul said, I'm busy about the call that God put upon my life. I'm busy about it. I go in at it day in, day out. I'm running after the things of the Lord. I work harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Rather than it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believe. And what is it that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose again on the third day. And the word of God is life for all who put their faith. He preached here was on the focus on the events. And that's what he talked about. He just laid it down. And every one of us who are believers in Christ, you have an event that happened in your life. It was Christ coming into your life. You have a story to share with others, how God met you and, and you gave your heart to him, that you heard the gospel message. You can talk about all the places where you've been. And then you can take, talk about the place of where you're at today. Because, see, all of us can relate to the fact that we've all been a mess at one time or another. Now, some of you might be uh, on the right side of the tracks. You came from the right family. But I'm just going to tell you, don't matter where your family are, all of, you, all of us are a mess when you're apart from Jesus Christ. Because your hope is in other things that will never satisfy you. Your only hope is in Him and Him alone. Paul is just sharing with us as believers in Christ that we have a story to tell. And that's what he was doing. He was telling them the history of it. And he was laying it out to the Jewish community that knew the history. And he was saying, can't you open up your heart that you might see that God's promise is for you today? Can you tonight that, that you're saying, I, 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 I believe, but I, I don't know if I, I believe that much. And, and the word of God just reminds us, I believe it helped me with my unbelief. If there's some things that you're questioning in your life, it's not because God's word's not true. It's because why we're not willing to put him on and just trust him. That trust is like this. I remember we were on vacation. Well, vacation for us was just this way here. That we would go to uh, a, a, another town rent a motel and stuff for two or three days. The kids could get in the pool. We could go shopping and those things. But I remember being in the water and my one of my children uh, was, a, was a little afraid of the water at all, but they knew I was out there and they just said, Daddy, here I come. And I was looking at something. I heard that voice, Dad, and she just jumped. And I called her. I went down. She stayed up. And then I came up, and God had done that in, in, in our lives and, and showed what it was with that. She was not afraid of jumping in the deep water. She just knew her daddy would catch her, and all she said, Daddy, and then she jumped. She wasn't afraid about those things there. All she knew is that if daddy is there, he'll catch him. We need to know that God will catch us every time. He's there for us, and we can trust him with our lives. He is there. And so Paul is just saying, I ran after him because why? He revealed himself to me in such a way that I could not help myself with, because I wanted all that he had in store for me. So the scriptures remind us, and, and it tells us about the goodness of God and all that he has in store for us. That God is God in all that we do and all that we say. That we can trust him with our lives and trust him with everything that is in us. And Paul preaching this has said, again, his eyes were focused on the events of what God had done in him and for him. What God had, had revealed to him. And he was doing all of these things that he might know him. 
So he focused on the things that actually happened, not that they were philosophies and, and the, theology, and those things are part in our, important in our Christian walk, but God had more for us to see. Sometimes we get so caught up on, on debating the scripture that we forget about the fact that the scriptures are what? That we might know God and walk with him in a greater way. And so we're just, we're, we, we get caught up in the wrong thing. And it's important that we know the word, but it's more than just having knowledge of scripture. It's about how do I take that living word and allow myself to begin to live in that word that God himself may be revealed to us. God has fulfilled this for us, their children. And that's what he was talking about. What God had promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he said he had now fulfilled it for the children of Israel because Jesus had came. And then he applied the truth of Jesus' resurrection. The resurrection means that Jesus truly is a unique uh, son of God. And Psalms 2, verse 7, And it proved that he was utterly holy even in his work. On the cross and in Psalm 16 10 for you will not abandon my soul uh, to show uh, or let your Holy One see corruption that he raised him on the third day and he gave life to him and life to all of us who put our trust in him in verse 38 it says with a promise and a warning Paul applied the truth of who Jesus is and what he did for us in verse 38, it was this here. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sin is proclaimed to you. And by him, everyone who believes is free. Are there some sin in your life that you realize now that got you all tied up? I ain't asking you. I don't care about what it is. I'm just asking you. Are you dealing with some things in your life that have you bound up? And he says, and if you have, that it says that through Christ, that every one of us who believe in him is set free from our sins. What it's saying is that you may be struggling, but your sins have been forgiven. You have a past, but your sins are forgiven. God does not look at your past because why? When you put your faith in Christ Jesus, the precious blood of Jesus was like that of a, a Mr. Clean Eraser. It just comes and it just goes over and it just gets rid of the, the scum and it gets rid of that and it's just crystal clear. God does that through the precious blood of Jesus. That his blood was shed for us and our sins have been forgiven. And it's important that we embrace that because why? There's many things that you, you cannot walk with because why? You're still living in your past where God wants you to see your future. All that you can be in him, all that he has called you to be, that is yours to have. And it's not because of your goodness, it's about how good God is to you and to me. And so here he was sharing with them, therefore brothers that this through this man, Jesus Christ, uh, the forgiveness of sin is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. And what he was just saying, your good works will never set you free. You have to have faith in Christ and him alone. And that's what he was telling to the Jewish people that he was speaking to in the synagogue on that day. Beware, therefore, least of what is said and, and the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and, and, and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe even if one tells, you, tells it to you. What he's saying was that they hardened their heart. There's a time that I've met people that said, I want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. They said, I had some trouble. I used to believe in Jesus. They said it. And then this happened in my life. How could a God have this happen? Hmm. And it's been some hard things, some difficult things. A parent loses a child. Uh, the marriage breaks up. The family uh, uh, implodes. And, and all of these things happen. They said, and where was God at in the midst? Well, had they still been angry at him? and would have embraced him, they'd have found a comfort and a peace and a strength in him that only he could have given them. But because they had locked up their heart, they were missing out on the things of God. And even when they read the promises of God, huh, the promise of God, I've done so many funerals over the years that the promise that I give to all 
is that when you know Jesus Christ, <laughs> this is not the end. I pointed that 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 casket and I said, that's not the end. I pointed those ashes, that's not the end. For the believer in Christ had taken their last breath here, but their first one in the presence of God, and that they're with him today. That there is a shell that is left, but who that person is, the spirit and soul has returned to the one who has given it. And that's the promise of God. And that's what the word of God preaches and teaches us. And sometimes we miss out on those things because why we are hard-headed. We will not believe what God is saying to us. And we'd rather hold on to our thoughts and our ideas instead of embracing the love of God. And I mean by it this way. Not only does sometimes the person does not forgive themselves of the sin, but the sin that has been done against us. And then God says, forgive as I have forgiven you. That is about you and I being set free when I forgive someone. I, it's not about them being set free. I'm letting them know I forgive you. But it's letting me know that I'm not going to hold this on anymore. I'm not going to carry this any longer. Now, there's times in your life that something comes up, it strikes you again, and it rises up, and you have to put it to death again. But you have to embrace the fact that I'm not going to let this anger control me anymore. I'm going to walk in the fullness of God. I'm going to trust God in the mess. I'm going to let him be God. And I'm just saying that because they were trying to live out something in themselves by trying to apply the law to their, to their lives. And though the law was good, the law was not able to save them. All it pointed out to them was that they needed a Savior. Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. It's not about what I do. It's about the finished work of Christ, what Jesus has done for you and, and for me. And everyone who believes is justified. Jesus does not not only forgive us, but we are also justified by him. And that the just live by faith, that means then that we're not guilty, that we've been set apart by the, the grace and the goodness of God. Forgiveness, forgiveness takes care of the debt of sin. But justification puts a positive credit on your account before God. And what that means is that the debt has been paid. It's been paid. You, you, there's nothing you have to do. Jesus has done it all. In verses 42 and 43, it says, As they went out, the people begged that these things might be told them the next Sabbath. That's important that we hear that. Here he is sharing with them. And the Jewish people were listening who had not received Christ. But they heard, and he began to, what? He had planted and he had water. And he's believing the Holy Spirit to make an increase. The people in themselves said, with the things that you are speaking, they're speaking to our heart. And they said to him, according to scripture, and as they went out, the people begged that these things, that on the next Sabbath day, that he would come back and share. And after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, it said many Jews and devout converts of Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who, as they spoke with them, urge them to continue in the grace of God. That it just said, man, you guys are speaking life to us. We're hearing this and we're hearing it now with understanding for the first time. It's important every now and then that we get that wake up and that shake up in God, that we begin to hear the word and it begins to excite us again about who God is. I find myself going through that as we've been going through Acts and, and going through Colossians, that there's been something that's been lit in me. And it seems like it's been a while, but it's alive in me. I was talking to again, as I said, that young man, and he said, there's something about it when we get together and we get to talking about the things of God, it makes you get excited and on fire again for the things of the Lord. And that's why it's so important that the children of God do not forsake the assembling of themselves together, but they continue together and encourage one another in the things of the Lord. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city, in verse 44 and 45, the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jewish saw, when the Jews saw the crowd that were filled with jealousy, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul and revealing. There's times that you're going to find that as you stand in your faith and talk about the transforming power of Christ, there's going to be others that will say to you, well, it, it doesn't take all of that. It, you don't have to do all that to be saved. 
But you have to do all of these things to walk in a right relationship with God and to know him. It's John 3.16 is the door opener to the relationship to God. But to know him is to walk through the door. It's to walk through in the process of that love that God has shown us. And it says, and they began to preach it. And some of the Jewish leaders then began to contradict everything that they were saying. Now, what they were trying to do is what contradict the truth that they had heard. They knew the word. That's why they invited him back. They knew what the word of God said, and he did not speak anything to them that they had not only heard, but what God had already promised. So when he talks about a resurrected Savior, the one that would not see decay, they knew what the word said, that there was going to be a promise of a Messiah that would come who would not die. Jesus is alive today as he was for the day that he came out of that tomb on the third day and has not changed. All power and authority has still been given to him, and he walks with that authority today, and we need to know that for our lives. It says they begin to contradict what was spoken by Paul and, and revealing reviling him and now they're on him they're talking trash to him all of those things there and they're trying to quiet the people down because they don't want the people turning their heart to the things of the lord isn't it amazing that when people are in a mess they don't want you to come uh, into the fullness of God. And when you're in the mess and you're separated from the things of God, you're like a person that is out in the water. You're, you're, you're drowning and you're hollering for help. But when help comes, hmm, you drag them down with you. And it says the lifeguard does what? He doesn't go out there into the water until the person out there struggling stops struggling. And the only way you're ever going to come into the saving knowledge of God is stop your struggling. You have to read. You have to begin to open up your heart to receive what God has because he's coming, but he's not coming to a heart that doesn't want him. He's coming to the heart that's saying, I heard and I believe, and I want you to reveal yourself to me that you're a God who is able to forgive. It says in verse 46 and 48, it says, And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It is necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you. And he's talking to the Jewish community. He says, Since you thirst... Thrust it aside, since you threw the word aside, he says, and uh, judge yourselves unworthy to eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. Here he is just saying what Jesus has said, that uh, when he was there and he came into Jerusalem and he began to weep because why? Here they were calling, shouting Hosanna. They were praising him and the Jewish community said, why don't you tell the people to be quiet and stop hollering? And Jesus said to them, if they don't shout it out, he says, the rocks will cry out. And from that moment on, their eyes began to close. They did not see the truth of why Jesus came in the first place. Paul is now sharing with them and Barnabas is sharing with them. And it says, and at that time, it says, since they thrust it aside, the, the truth of the gospel, and that judge yourself unworthy to enter eternal life, behold, you are turning, we're turning to the Gentiles. I said, we're not going to fool with you. We're not going to wrestle you down. You are out there in the water, and when you come to your senses, the gospel of Jesus Christ will come to you. You will open up your heart for understanding. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light up for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. It said all of a sudden, when they heard, but God wants you. Wait a minute. He had offered it to the Jewish community. They said, we don't want it. He said, that's fine. Gentiles, Jesus came for you. There was a rejoicing they had there. And what was it? They were Gentiles who had not turned to Judaism. They had heard the truth, but there was something in them that wanted more, and that's what was shared with them, the promise of God that comes through Jesus Christ. That is the more that all are looking for. They're looking in different ways and understanding, but what they need to know today, there's only one to, is able to lead you to salvation, and his name is Jesus. That was born of a virgin, walked this earth 30 some odd years, died on the cross, was beaten and bruised and then was nailed to the cross, died on the cross, was buried, and rose again on the third day. That is the one that is able to save. And anything other than that is a lie. Anything other than that is not the truth. 
There is no saving grace for anyone apart through Jesus Christ, who is the Savior. And the word of the Lord is said, is spreading throughout the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city and stirred up a persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out uh, of their district. But they shook off the dust from their feet and against them and went to Iconium. And it says, And the disciples were filled with joy of the Holy Spirit. When we look at the Word of God tonight, it lets us know that we continue to preach the Word of God that is life. And there will be those that will embrace it and those who will reject it. But the promise of God is for who everyone who will believe. Tonight, I don't know where you're at. Maybe you're in that place and you're saying, I, 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 I believe, but help me with my unbelief. Maybe you're, you're saying that, I know my kids are saved, but uh, I remember taking them to church. I remember they got baptized, but they, what they're lacking now is an understanding of what God's promises have. And it's important that we get that in us and they begin to see us walk, what? In the cloth of God, that they see us walking in the newness of life, that they see us trusting him in our coming and in our going, and that they understand that we're praying for them, believing God for them. Mom and dad, do not be afraid to continue to share this hope with your children. Because if you don't share a hope in a living God, they're going to try to find hope in something else. And anything else that they find, try to find hope in is sudden death to them. For there's only life in one, and his name is Jesus. And so here tonight we looked at the word. And what it was saying was that when they began to share the, the word with others, it opened up their understanding. Some thought, I knew it all and I don't need it. But there was others who were saying, I've heard about it. But tonight, it made sense to me. I don't know where you're at, but maybe tonight the Word of God made sense to you, and you're saying, I want all that Jesus has in store for me. And if that's where you're at tonight, you just need to know that He has heard your cry. All you have to do is say, Lord, I believe that you sent your Son to die for me, and He died that I might live, and my sins are forgiven, and I'm asking Jesus to live in my life and the Word of God tells us that the Holy Spirit will give new life to you. You say, is it that simple? It wasn't that simple. He had to die for your sins. He was beaten and bruised for your sin. That he was, God came and, and was punished, spit upon all of those things that you might have life. He was punished and it says that he was a curse because of you, that you might have life in him. No, it wasn't easy. But he said, not my will, God, to the Father, but your will be done. And his will is that what? None should perish, that all should come into everlasting life. I pray tonight that's what you are saying. I want everlasting life in Christ Jesus. And then maybe you're the one tonight that said, you know, I, I know a lot about the word of God. But I don't know about the word that became life to me. And maybe that's where you're at tonight. And this is where we begin to take steps of faith in the Word of God, that He might reveal Himself to us in this day in which we live in. I just know unto you tonight that there's so many want to see the beacon light of God revealed in their darkness, that they might come to the truth. Let us pray. Father, we come tonight and we thank you, Lord, for life eternal. We thank you, Lord, for Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior and King. And we thank you, Lord, that the simplicity of your Word is clear. Many of us have heard the, the Christmas story. Many of us have heard, Lord, the Easter story and the Good Friday story. But Lord, as we put it all together, it tells us of a story of a plan of a creator who desires all men, mankind, to know him as their savior. Jesus, you are our answer and the answer for all who will put their faith in you. Lord, I pray tonight that you will use us Use us in our coming and our going, Lord, that we'll not be ashamed of this gospel, but we'll be ready to tell the story of why we believe what we believe and what you have done in our life by faith and faith alone. I thank you tonight, Lord. We ask your blessing, Lord, upon on, on those that are sick and afflicted, those that are dealing with the, the concerns of the, the virus, Lord, that is out there uh, 
And we pray tonight, dear Heavenly Father, that there are some that are in that uncertainty. They're not uh, knowing if they have it or not. And I'm, we're just going to say in the name of Jesus, be healed by faith. Be healed in the name of Jesus. And Lord, and we thank you tonight that we can pray for one another in the boldness of God and believe that by his stripes we are healed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. I heard that.